All righty. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning for Circular Tank. Uh, really exciting uh, to see you all here uh, as part of West Tech Fest 2020. So thanks for getting up early and coming into Murdoch University Space Cube for a delicious holy bagel, uh, a coffee, some connection uh, with other good humans, and to hear some stories uh, this morning from some really special founders. Uh, I think we've got about five this morning. I think we had potentially six on the card. Um, even Naren's hobbled in as well. Um, so yeah, really excited to hear from them this morning. So just a quick uh, recap. Uh, a few of you joined us uh, last Thursday night for the WA celebration of the Australian Circular Economy Hub. So that's a really exciting project uh, that we've been working on um, for about 80 months. But definitely do check that out. Um, you can find all the information online at acehub.org.au. Uh, and we've also got that up on our YouTube channel um, and on our website as well. Um, there's a heap of good recordings and stuff from that event. Um, that was over at Space by Spacecubes. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to do um, this morning, uh, just as a bit of an icebreaker, so if you sat down on a chair here, you would have seen uh, a card on the chair um, that says Wicked Pitch. So Wicked Pitch is an icebreaker game um, we play at Holonic. So what I want you to do is go and find someone um, that you've probably not met before or don't know too well, or maybe had a brief conversation this morning and thought that you might want to go them, uh, get to know them a little bit more. So we could pitch, um, so you're going to have two minutes with this person to, the first thing you do is, and the instructions are on the card, is to um, pick a famous actor or actress, politician, musician, sports personality or innovator and then select a wicked challenge. So one of the themes this morning is gonna be about um, how entrepreneurship and business um, can tackle some really complex challenges in the world. Um, and I'll give an added layer in there as well. Think about circular tech. So if you can come up with an idea that, that maybe is a circular tech solution, that'll be even better bonus points. So yeah, off you go, go and find someone in the room. Um, bit of a human experiment, I'm going to leave it up to you. Um, I'm going to get the speakers involved as well. Hey, how All righty, so your two minutes is just about up. So you can wrap up your conversation there. Yes, just a really quick icebreaker activity. So if you want, you can think of a name for your idea, and I'm going to ask a few folks to share back with the room what they came up with. 
It's up to you. It's a pretty open, open challenge. All righty, so if you just want to grab a safe place. All righty. Who would like to share with the group uh, what they came up with? So what I'll ask you to do is just to share the uh, persona or the person that you picked, the challenge, and then what your solution was, and you got a cool name, and how it related to circular tech. Just here in the front. Good morning. Uh, my name's Madeline, and this is Simon. And today we are Elon Musk, and we just sold property. Oh. <laughs> so this is a twofold approach. Uh, the first stage is uh, through the Hyperloop program. Okay, so I'm just speak about that. Yep. So I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with him. Likely they are. Um, but Elon has a business where they're planning to dig a lot of holes to build underground uh, uh, so networks for cars and potentially trains and things in the future. As part of that process, they need to dig up a lot of dirt from the ground and Elon Musk himself is a potential then to solve poverty. And through this business of digging the high blue tunnels, they have to get a lot of waste material out of the ground. And they actually have the generally designed process to create bricks out of that. And so Elon Musk is gonna to decide to donate these bricks to communities where they can build houses for people who are in poverty. Wow. Awesome. And for everyone who wants a second break because Earth hasn't been that kind to them, they're also able to go to Mars and colonise with the homeless population so that they can have a new chance at life. Oh, right. <laughs> Round of applause, that's awesome. Well done. Someone came from this side of the room to share. Anyone really passionate about the idea they came up with? Maybe an idea for a new business? We, we, we all did something else. <laughs> we chose Jordan Peterson uh, and then food waste. And uh, I don't know how many people know that Jordan Peterson's uh, like have a case of carnival diet. So um, yeah, we, I think we kind of boxed ourselves in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you give us another five minutes, maybe we can come up with something. <laughs> no worries. Um, one more. Maybe I might go over to some of the speakers. Did anyone here have a good discussion or a good idea they came up with? No. <laughs> we were just planning our Christmas break. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great, enough said. I think it is. It is that time of year. And, and on that note, we're really excited. This is actually our last event in Alpha 2020 um, as part of Super Economy Perth. So, yeah, um, bagels, brews, and bands. Um, I was having a bit of a play on, on the on the bagel today, which will be a big thing. Um, so you'll hear me say that word a few times. Um, we're going to go through some founder stories and then um, have a really great dialogue, and then hopefully have some time aside at the end for networking. But we will have to be out of here at nine am, and we can get you all off to work or, or wherever you need to go for the day. Um, but we do encourage you if you want to keep connecting. There is a coffee shop downstairs as well. So I'd like to start just by acknowledging that we meet um, on Wajak Buja, um, so on Noongar country and, and acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet um, and pay my respects to elders uh, past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge, um, I just realized I probably haven't introduced myself. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dylan and I'm the co-founder um, and ecosystem lead at Holonic, um, along with my Incredible business partner Andrew, who's just in the corner of the room, Andy, put your hand up. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in what we do, do, do come have a chat to us at the end. Um, Sacred Economy Perth is, yeah, I guess one of our products or services that we put on, um, and we're really lucky to get um, grant funding from the Department of Water and Water and Environment Regulation uh, for 2020 to put these on um, and keep them sort of accessible um, to the community. So, thanks for coming along um, and being a part of our last one. 
I'd like to also acknowledge Space Cubed. Here's Amelia. Yeah, no, she might have popped out in the start of the workday. Um, so Amelia is the space manager um, and coordinator for Murdoch University Space Cubed. Um, but we're really lucky for Space Cubed to support all of our events um, and always give us beautiful facilities. They're putting on the coffee um, and some of the other refreshments this morning as well. So thanks to Space Cubed. Um, and as well, just some of our great supporters. So you'll be hearing from Rob from Hippie Kombucha a bit later. Um, we're usually drinking their delicious kombucha at our events. Um, there's a heap of other um, small businesses um, that we procure from and also just people in the community, we call them polons, um, that just contribute their time and their efforts um, to put these experiences on. So thanks to all those people. So um, I had this conversation with one of the um, speakers today, uh, Rebecca Loftus, and she said to me, she said, I, uh, I Googled circular tech. Uh, We're going to tell them that. <laughs> okay, I won't, I won't give too much away, but um, I feel like a bit of context is needed. So for West Tech Fest um, this year, so West Tech Fest is running all week. There's a heap of great events. Um, you can check that out online at West Tech Fest. Um, if you just Google West Tech Fest. But Circular Tech for me is about, um, I think one of the real big things this morning is about reimagining what tech is and tech entrepreneurship and tech innovation is. Because um, I think there is, we can get a little addicted at times to software and digital solutions when a lot of the problems um, in the world today come back to people. Um, so for me, um, circular tech is circular economy, um, entrepreneurship and innovation, but it's also about um, how we imagine, how we, how we imagine technology, how we use technology. Um, we really believe that we need to shift from smart tech to sort of wise use of technology. So um, have a think about that today. But um, yeah, uh, the, other, the other reflection I had was what my favorite um, bits of circular tech are. Um, and as a, a designer, I'm really lucky um, to work with some great um, startups um, and software sort of entrepreneurs in Perth. Um, and probably two of my favorites at the moment, one is a, a startup called RideFair. <laughs> Um, which is positively disrupting the ride share industry. Um, and that's like a cooperative model uh, for ride sharing. So that's one of my favorites. And I also use um, an, an old sort of Facebook app called Junto, which is built on Holochain. So that's two of my favorites, but I encourage you to have a, have a think about what yours might be, um, maybe throughout the course of this morning and, sh and share them with someone else you met. So, um, this morning, um, we were very intentional with our catering. Um, so we, we bought bagels um, from the Holy Bagel Company in Caddy Vale. Um, Andy picked them up, they were fresh baked, probably about three this morning. Um, we were gonna do donuts, because I'm gonna talk a little bit in a moment about donut um, economics, but we went with bagels because they're a bit healthier. So there, there's the bagel. Um, has anyone read or, or is familiar with donut economics? Quick show of hands, a few people. Cool, so Donut Economics is an awesome book. Um, definitely give it a read, um, be a really good one to get uh, for Christmas, share with the family, share with friends, um, and read in some downtime. Um, there we go. Um, <laughs> so Bagel Economics is maybe what I'm gonna to refer to it as today. Um, I think Julia gave me that one. Um, so I just very briefly wanted to talk to um, what the circular economy is and some of the different narratives we use. Um, but I'm going to refer to donut economics. So donut economics uh, is a model, um, and I just want to touch on this briefly, but I encourage you to go away um, and learn more about it, is a model for our economy globally um, that can work long term. Um, so the bagels there as well. Um, so think as you ate your bagels this morning, um, how we can all collaborate, come together, learn new things, I think challenge, constantly challenge our own assumptions um, and upgrade and evolve ourselves as humans to be better leaders, to be better entrepreneurs, to be better friends, to be whatever it is. Um, in the context of bagel economics, donut economics, which is all about um, creating a safe and just world where everyone thrives. Alrighty, so that's enough from me. So the format uh, this morning is, so what I'm going to invite each, um, so one by one, I'm going to invite uh, the founders up. So I'm going to give them just maybe two minutes if they just want to share their story. And it's basically um, creative freedom. So if you want to talk about your business, 
um, if you want to talk about um, your journey through sort of surviving and thriving uh, through 2020, or if you want to just talk about bagels, um, it's up to you. So please give Rebecca Loftus a warm round of applause. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about bagels for two minutes and keep moving. Uh, so my name is Rebecca and um, my background is in education, particularly science, technology and maths education. Um, when I became a teacher 10 years ago, it didn't take me long to think uh, things aren't great in the education system. And um, particularly working in some of the disadvantaged schools here in Perth, realised that equity is a big challenge in the Australian system. And really, we're just still operating in this like kind of industrial paradigm, you know, where and standardization, control, and kind of linear pathways for students dominate. Uh, and it's just not really appropriate to the context we live in today. So this year, um, myself and two co-founders launched IDEA, Innovation Design Entrepreneurship Academy. And it's for year 11 and 12 students, because we found that year 11 and 12 was the, really the most conservative years of education, kind of HR exams dominate. And how the model works is it's really just um, flipped the system, I guess. So it's a completely human-centered approach to education. There's no timetables, no set curriculum, no subject teachers and certainly no exams. Students come to us. They, we talk to them about what their interests are and uh, what they might like to explore um, for their two years with us. And we just create experiences. We design an, ex an education experience around their, them exploring their interests. It's a bit of a try before you buy a model with uni as well and, and, and a lot of work integrated learning. So it's a, a two year program and at the end of it, you walk away with a portfolio of credentials, nationally recognized credentials, uh, work experiences and an idea of how you want to have a purposeful life and, and contribute as an active citizen. And the, the, the link to the circularity and why um, I, I collaborate a lot with Hellenic is um, with education, it's a real complex systemic issue, shifting or flipping the system. And that has been my interest um, and the focus of my PhD, which I'm doing on the side, um, is systems change. And so similar, in a similar way to the, um, with the shift to a circular economy, how do we shift the education system? They're, they're quite similar problems and it comes down to things like policy, but also cultural change. So I'm excited to talk about that today. Uh, thanks, Beck. If you want to just grab a seat there in the end, um, right on time as well, so well done. Um, setting a good, good first example for the rest of the, the speakers this morning. Next up uh, is Rob White, co founder of PP Kombucha. Rob? It's a really odd photo. <laughs> I've been on LinkedIn for about three years, still trying to get me started. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, a few firsts since I met Phil. I, I had my first bagel, what, only three weeks ago. I haven't had one before. So, yeah, amazing. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess for me, my background is, is not in uh, kombucha by any means. Um, I come from a, it's a, a business background in finance, uh, financial planning, and did that for quite a number of years. Um, it sort of came to the conclusion, like we had a we had a business which was kind of running itself up until about 2013. And I kind of fell out of luck with the industry and, and as you do, sort of tinkering with business and found all the things that we all decided. And 2014 kind of got involved with um, what it is today is, is Hippie Kombucha. So we were originally called Hippie Juice, not many people know that. Um, and we actually started when Kombucha was still a very new category in Australia. Uh, it certainly wasn't competitive, we were really one of the first in Perth. And we were sort of trotting around on weekends trying to sell this hippie juice to IGAs and they're like, hey, we love the stories, of course, and stuff, that's great, but no, we're not going to buy it. <laughs> I don't know what the butcher is. So, uh, and then, yeah, we're fortunate, I guess, um, a couple of years later, we had Coca Cola and Lion Nathan enter the industry, um, you know, known as Remedy and Mojo's today. Uh, and they pretty much just you know, paved the path for the growth of the butcher. So now we're in probably one of the most competitive industries. And uh, about two, three years ago, we started looking inwards in our business. I'd sold out of my other businesses at this point. I thought, well, you know, um, what didn't I enjoy about that business? And I guess it was a very linear way in which money's handled. And coming from a financial background, I thought anything I do going forward, so they've got to improve lives, they've got to enrich people. And I just felt there's so much in my life I've been just really drawing resources out of people in communities. So I thought, that's no, time to make this right. So, Quite fitting that I ended up in, a, in an organic business such as kombucha. And then, um, yeah, just through the rise of the category, we saw challenges in distribution. Uh, we're constantly being questioned about our pricing and our, our model. 
And we, uh, we just kind of huddled in and thought, well, what do we really care most about? And that's, I guess, about the product that exists in the bottle. So, yeah, and it was maybe 18 months ago, I we stumbled across Hill and one of the first circular economy events, and we thought, well, this is kind of the stuff that we don't know how to say that we're doing anyway. Um, and I guess what Lonnie did and, and Circular Perth was really actually brought a network of people together where we could actually fully understand that there are good businesses and good people out there trying to find a way in this world but not really sure how to do it. So um, yeah, this man, I think anyone that knows him, he's probably the great connector in Perth um, and just builds a platform for people to get together and discuss the story. So uh, our, our short time working with Lonnie, we've met a lot of good business partners um, and I guess back to Kombucha, we've found it over the last 12, 18 months. Our business model has really built away from you know, what we've worked on for seven years, which was the you know, only IGAs, and we're actually finding growth um, and easy growth through probably better partnerships such as the corporates or the even you know, uh, different sorts of uh, suppliers that want to work in a more ethical way around supply products. So that are more focused on circularity, return to base, um, so yeah, so COVID was actually particularly bad for us for the first three days. We didn't we had a business and then uh, uh, pretty much from strength to strength since then we've been able to reinvent the business. On the back of that, cheers. Rob got three minutes because he was saying uh, so many nice things about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Right, so next up, um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Daryl Nadu, um, who I'm titling today a food systems entrepreneur, but he's um, had some really exciting projects um, over the years. So I'm going to give Daryl a couple of minutes to talk a bit about himself and what he's working on at the moment. Excellent. That was my wedding. Oh. <laughs> uh, guys, my, my name is Daryl. Um, I am a chemical engineer and chemist by training and just working in the gas sector. Uh, saw the scale of what that I created and it's like. And circular economy, part of the reason why I'm uh, so interested in what the building manager is doing, is uh, something that I believe is a good, uh, strong embodiment of exactly what sustainability is. Most industries around us talk about uh, actually. You know, providing that, that mechanism and that uh, measurement piece to what the efficient is. And uh, so I left the industry uh, about three years ago in 2017 and I started a business called the New Normal Bar and Kitchen. Uh, it's essentially a small bar and restaurant with a circular lens applied to the assets. So uh, we were, so, um, like, unlike the, the rest of the businesses here that are just in their, their infancy getting started, we actually closed our business in 2019. Uh, so we went from being in 2017, the uh, best new restaurant in Western Australia, uh, one of the top 15 restaurants in WA, featured in Michael in their top 50 uh, restaurant awards in 2019, so closing our doors. Um, there was a lot of interest in what we were doing. Um, unfortunately, I think what we were doing was challenging. Uh, our customers basically were too much. And we were really uh, not competitive with the uh, relation to the interests of our customers. Uh, to in Perth, a lot of that interest was in more casualized, uh, more comfortable dining as well. Um, anyway, the, um, that business was essentially a proof of concept uh, for a digital platform that we were looking to build that really looked to intercept the consumer at the point of their demands really becoming a decision for them. Um, so, looking at ways in which we can provide all the relative, relevant information around seasonality and uh, the life cycle cost of their dining decision. At the point that they feel like they're hungry and they're not doing something for dinner. So, essentially, superimposing uh, <coughs> seasonal calendars and life cycle assessments over a uh, recipe problem uh, and providing that level of information analysis. So, this is a business that has been ongoing for about three years and one that we, or well, I am looking to launch very shortly. I'm struggling finding decent front end talent to come and work with me. So, 
Um, part of the reason why I've uh, really taken the door of the opportunity is that I want to be longer. But also, it's something that I feel like it is out there. It's something in the realm of social enterprise that helps provide that issue. Uh, that's it. Right. Right. Daryl, and um, I first met Daryl Eating at the New Normal um, many years ago with a, a close friend of mine, and it was an awesome project. Um, and still one I, I refer to um, a lot. Um, I'm a bit of a foodie myself, but I think learning from your failures as well might be a, a um, thing this morning as well. So thanks, Daryl. And if you think you can help him out and have maybe a key skill set and are, are interested in food systems, um, have a chat to Daryl um, afterwards. So next is um, Narendra, uh, co-founder of Vincense. Narendra, if you want to hobble over up to the front, that'd be great. So, Narendra, good morning, everyone. Uh, here we're going to start explaining what I thought of playing the role of being able to go. Waiting for a result on the Express campus is normal. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks, thanks for having me here today. And uh, yeah, my journey started, uh, I was always uh, I was always acting as a way for a product developer for a range of mining businesses. And uh, um, all I do in my, during those days was I would travel across the world and we look at all the challenges they have and we come up with a solution. So that was my background to get me into the research and development side of it. And through that journey, I sort of got exposed to a lot of the, um, uh, the dark side of what was exposed to ABC, one of white. Because, uh, South America, Africa, West Africa, a lot of places. And, uh, and it was always on the back of my mind, why is all this stuff a challenge? And when you talk to the locals, and the emotion they carry through is quite amazing. Uh, so that was always lingering on my mind. And then three years uh, back, I uh, just decided, you know, I ended up just having it in my mind. I should probably start doing something about it. And that's how I started a uh, few businesses in the waste management space. And uh, Vincent is uh, one of the key ones that has been going for the last 18 months. Um, that business was started around the uh, underlying problem of contamination in waste. And so, uh, and Warren Waste was sort of exposing that too. So a lot of, uh, you know, dry recyclables, uh, a lot of your know, food waste bins often have contaminations, uh, and it's not that the users are throwing the wrong stuff in the wrong way, it's just that the, there's not enough education and there's not enough information around where the material should go. So that's where we started that business, where it's a center that would sit on your bin, the look out for signatures of contamination, and then it would then provide targeted education to households. Uh, and since then, we've found some really amazing applications, not just for residential, <coughs> but also for business applications. Um, and and we are now exploring some really amazing opportunities with um, KFC and McDonald's. We'll talk a bit about it, but they also have some big challenges with contamination. Uh, how I got involved with Colonic, uh, I think it was probably um, 18, or maybe even just before that, 18 or 24 months ago, because I was very closely with the uh, Space Cube uh, startup. And in fact, one of my business was part of the Sprint program, and quite interested in what Colonic is doing in the circular economy. and. Uh, with the other business we are involved with uh, that help business to business waste management, we found that they don't really understand circular economy. They always been in the media economy, and and they're still trying to find ways how we can bring this collaboration together, where we can get it to think differently. Because currently all they do is they procure and they throw away, and and that all has to change if you want to go into the circular economy. Uh, and so we're constantly looking for ways of collaboration, and I think. Um, Oh, I'm going to do a great job on that and gave me that group. So, yeah, that's my quick speech there. Awesome. You're probably thinking that I paid these speakers just to say good things about this morning. I think everyone's just in a festive mode. Lucky last. Um, and Julia was also um, kind enough to speak um, on short notice at our event on Thursday night. But um, another one of my favourite local entrepreneurs, please give Julia Heiser or Risa a warm welcome. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we only had four tall stools, but uh, tall stools. But um, whoever gets the short stool gets the um, the little toy as well. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, my name is Julia, I'm from Brazil, and um, I'm an oceanographer, which is basically some of the only logs to study oceans. 
Uh, I've, been, I've done my honors in Brazil in climate change, a master's on the feeding ecology of turtles, uh, studying which type of seaweeds the, the turtles were eating. And then in 2009, I moved to Australia to learn English um, because language is not my strength. Um, it took me a while, but I think I'm managing. Um, and uh, yeah, when my English was good enough, I got a scholarship to do my PhD at uh, UWA on plastic pollution, which is a topic that I've been researching since then. And it's been around 10 years, so it's been a while. Um, yeah, since I finished my PhD, uh, the first job I got was with a Dutch foundation called the Ocean Cleanup. Uh, that uh, is lots of crazy Dutch people trying to develop machines to get rubbish out of oceans and rivers. And um, I was the first employee together with Warren's Lab when we were 17 by then. And now it's like 70 people. It was a great experience to see that exponential growth in my startup with that. Uh, and then more recently, I also did some work at In the Room, the family office of the forest which is re really where I found out that I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship. Um, through that job, I had an opportunity to look at lots of inspiring businesses working on the circular economy space and tackling plastic pollution. I really felt very really, really, like, inspired by that. And um, I also realized that there was an opportunity to be doing more upstream when it comes to our pollution issues, uh, including plastic pollution, which is my area. Um, and I felt that that's an area where I wanted to focus on around developing and compiling, um, compelling, sorry, that's a new word that I have not told my co-founder, Michael, I'm still a compelling alternative uh, to fossil fuel plastics. And, um, and one of the issues is like, what do you replace the fossil fuel with? You know, if you go to corn or soy, you're going to have lots of issues. So um, we decided to start to develop biopolymers with uh, seaweed. And um, yeah, also that idea really got in my mind. I was dreaming about it. I was like, okay, I'm just going to leave my job and yeah, try to create a startup on that. And, um, but I thought that I needed a co-founder because I'm more of a scientist. So I was searching for one, and in January this year I met Michael, who is that? <laughs> who is the co-founder of Yulu? It's the name of our startup, and uh, since then we've been developing, um, yeah, the technology, and also the, the business on how to create this new healthy polymer that can support a system that's more circular. But, you know, what materials we use is also quite important, and um, yeah, that's that's me. Yeah. Right. I just had the idea as well. I wonder if um, maybe it's a bit of a lead gen product. We could get some uh, seaweed holy bagels going. That's all We can connect you up. With and the... we can go to Indonesia to work with them. It's yeah, amazing. So we've got, um, it's nearly 8.20, so we've got about another 40 minutes. But I'm going to ask one question to sort of get the panel going. But then I'd love to hear from the floor. So have a think of um, some questions you've got um, for our panelists. Feel free to um, share your name and, and an organisation you represent. Um, and yeah, it's a really good opportunity, I think, um, if you're a, a, an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, um, you know, driving innovation and systems change within a large organisation. Um, yeah, let's have a really healthy dialogue and discussion um, this morning. So my first question is going to be, um, maybe um, just to sort of cut through it a bit and get pretty candid. Share with us through your journey as a founder or you know growing and working in business like a, a fuck up and, and what you learned from it and what you did. Alright <laughs> 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 And I, I fucked up I didn't get five chairs this morning so <laughs> I only got four. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think uh, one of my major sources of fuck ups uh, in opening and running my own business is uh, really uh, probably in some ways relying too heavily on the performance of others. So in other words, betting on races that you're not running. Um, you end up with, and so obviously. This is in reference to new normals of business, and 
We were really at the cutting edge. You know, we were the first commercial entity in Australia to put in LED uh, and Wi-Fi controlled lighting, so removing all the uh, I guess the proper capacitors and things that would require transmission uh, that kind of um, That came with a lot of issues, and there was you know one supplier, one source of knowledge. Uh, we also went with a more circular supply of uh, Yes, yes. Uh, but we didn't actually go into the infrastructure. I never thought that someone provisioning a service with the attacks would just walk away from the service that they were meant to provide. I uh, mean, we were left with a very sub um, These are things that I, I think are, are really important issues to address in the context of the circular economy. Um, and these are, you know, conversations that Tim and I have had as well, which, you know, before I had entered this space, I would not have thought it would have been issue. Well, someone committed to provision of service and then decided the service they committed to provide was actually not cost effective for them. They had under, uh, under invested in the tendering process essentially. And then with all the infrastructure. Certainly. Anyone else going to fuck up the chair? We've all got to narrow it down. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, yeah, so one of the challenges we had with Vincent was that uh, when we started the business, there was a lot of media talks at the time with uh, imaging and camera and how it's been used to monitor voice and people's behavior, etc. And it was, it was driving, uh, the video was quite driving negative behavior in the process, saying that this is all a big boss and, you know, um, it's, uh, it's not what we want, etc. Uh, but when we came out with this product, it was underlying, uh, underlying thinking that we want to educate people, that is what we brought to with. And it has no camera, it doesn't have any barcodes or anything, so it doesn't look for what you buy, it doesn't look for what you put in your bin, it looks for the signatures of contamination, that's all. So it took us a while to get the message across to the council, and uh, and uh, and we were quite, I think, banging our head against the wall, saying, "What's going on wrong here?" Because we know there's a technology that can work, but why is it not being adapted? And uh, at one point, I think uh, we then went to the first council that came on board with us and said, "Okay, this is our issue here. We're seeing a lot of media attention. What do we do here?" And then, interestingly, they were quite updated and said, "You know, rather than us telling this is going to happen, they're going to tell the community that this." Is Happen. And they will actually do a media release about what's going to be done with this technology. Uh, and when that happened, and we did the first community engagement with the council, uh, it was so interesting that there was a lot of positive outcome of that. So I think the media was sort of playing a lot of negativity in that process. And uh, it's still, they still are like three days ago, four days ago, there was another article from Sydney. Um, I can't quote the newspaper, but they, uh, they, they had an article called uh, Don't Bin Shame. <laughs> and uh, they were just checking, uh, reading that article, saying, you know, when you have these sort of things going around and you're trying to address it with the same population, you know, getting people on board. Uh, so this is our starting point to help them change their thinking. And then from there on comes all the other behavior change. So, so yeah, that was our probably uh, a challenge. And, and, uh, Sort of a still a ongoing problem for us. Should we all talk about that? I have yeah, a if you've got one, you'd have to talk about it. Yeah. Unless if there's, if there's a question from the floor, um, please stick your hand up and I'll, I'll give you a mic. But yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, I was thinking which one was the third one. I think when well, well, there was five times. It was nice. A nice turnaround was when I was working for the ocean cleanup, and then my first scope of work was to map this area that's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And um, and boy, and asked, we need to play the boats in the water. And um, I was like, and I'm very optimist sometimes. And I was like, yeah, each boat is going to be between five and ten k, and you can put the boat in the water. And so we went to Palo Alto, got the money, come back, and then realized that we needed like orders of magnitude more money to make it happen. I was like, oh my god. But then at the end, I found like a fleet of sailors that go from California to Hawaii and then they need to bring the boats back. So then, uh, yeah, then in less minutes, they decided to go even lower than the budget. So at the end, they did fix the problem. But it was almost like a disaster. And I'll turn this to my last question. 
Tell us about some of these kombucha wars. Oh, look, that's another story. But yeah, I think we'll almost feel like fuck up to where I the eyes. Um, I mean, just, just really, the, the, the most recent one was sticking down to the council. So we just, um, and this just happened a couple of weeks ago, we supported all these new call rooms and everything. Anyway, we we'll pay for instant asset write off, and they're sitting in a warehouse where they've probably never been six months because they've been installed. So that's just, um, that's just one thing, just trying to understand. We'll think you understand how things work, but um, probably overall, we live in a we work in a very organic industry, so uh, we've been humbled a lot by actually the ingredient that we use. So, um, we use a lot of seasonal produce and we put very um, organic in nature in the way that we source, um, we look at our upstream always, and um, we've been humbled, I guess, by the availability of product and our promises to our suppliers and our stores. So yeah, that's, a, that's an ongoing fuck up, just over promising and under delivery. You can't get that one around, around the wrong way. But um, yeah, I, I think um, my biggest takeaway is always for everything you do is just, just be fluid and I think this is the word agile, but you need to be agile in business. And, um, certainly in food production, just be ready to, you know, apologise and make it right. And uh, trust your gut. So I will trust your gut for once. Thanks. Yeah, I guess mine is just around um, like the systems change problem. So if you're looking to disrupt a system, and um, the experience for us in trying to disrupt education has been a delicate balance of like pushing traditional boundaries, but ensuring that we operate within the current policy and funding context. Um, and it has been a challenge because you want to be a, an entrepreneur and you know, you're thinking about the product and the customer and delivery. But again, we have this really bureaucratic system um, and it's really important that we navigate that with caution as well. Um, and so we, we kind of talk about ideas, it's like little innovation that's on the edges of the system, because it does allow you to do the good work and prove that something can be done, and then go back to, um, I guess, the systemic overlords and say, look, we've got a costed solution here for you. But one interesting day was where we went to meet with the Department of Education Services and to kind of have a casual coffee, talk about our thing, and like, Oh, uh, and we thought it was going to be really important. We got there, and the lady who was very kind was like, "So, oh, um, it's your. Do you have much on for today?" And we we're like, "Uh, no." No, she's like, "Okay, great. And um, I'm, I'm going to need you to take down your website. And uh, if you, um, how many social media pages do you have? If you take them all down um, as well. Uh, the thing is, I'm, I'm technically, um, I'm limited on about ten thousand dollars." Um, a day, or uh, $10,000 and $100 a day, and just because of some of the wording on your website. And we were like, okay. <laughs> now I just, my co-founder knew this, but yeah, I just met her. And Nicole went out to make some phone calls, so I was kind of like, <sighs> like, I was like, what do you do? You can't make small talk. Now, in the end, it was fine. Um, and there were, it was a miscommunication in terms of our model. So we wouldn't have been eligible for a fine. But it was just that it, it's, I guess, yeah, when you're doing um, work that is challenging the status quo and the hardest thing is trying to push boundaries while honoring current um, policy or um, and current conditions. So, yeah, it, it was a save in the end, but um, a potential massive fuck up. But, and it just came down to a wording because we're, we're not a school. We can't advertise to be a school, and, and, but we were advertising and that we do offer a, a, the voice certificate. Anyway, we do that with a, with a partnership that is all the book board. <laughs> she wasn't aware of that, so she's like, you can't advertise a school if you don't register school. It's $10,000 a day fine. That was a good thing. I have heard that story before, it's a funny one. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> um, let's get some questions from all of you. Um, who wants to kick us off? Anyone? I'll get one. Yeah. I'll get one. Um, so it sounds like, I'm just looking for a theme of what's happening here. It seems that the, the fundamental um, difference is in the philosophy or the belief or perhaps the approach from, you know, systemic um, model that's very, very, very ingrained and a model that's emerging that, that I think a lot of people in this room would say, rely on So what, I guess my question is, how do we think and maybe the solution hasn't happened, but maybe you know, like what you just said, the learning that you had from that. How do we how do we close that gap or create a bridge 
to discover um, new possibilities. And I guess where I'm coming from is the model that we live with now and the model that's trying to be created seem to be opposed, um, but I think fundamentally are not opposed at all. I think we all, if we ask people, you know, what's really important to you, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we, from an evolutionary point of view, right, how do we all evolve? And I mean, I'm talking about like a human level, so an individual level, but also humanity. How do we evolve to the potential that we are meant to? Right? It sounds like you guys are all trying, and I think everyone in this room, we're all trying to evolve to that. So how do we invite people to evolve to their potential when the systems seem to be holding them back? Can I answer that one, please? Yeah, I'm going to give you a very quick answer. <laughs> so um, no, that's a great question, and it's one that um, actually sort of plays where I managed over COVID. Um, no, just individually, the people within our organisation, we're very connected to, I guess, um, to to Earth and to I guess our locality, um, and we're constantly conscious about things don't always work out right, and we we just learned to be okay as I said before with availability of the product, and uh, it's just been a reminder with COVID that not everything is permanent, um, and things come and go. So you need to be sure in your business, uh, which is also humbling, but it's um, it's also if you kind of own that in your business. You know, there will be times where things aren't going to go your way. But COVID has kind of taught us that that connection is to, um, to where we are, to just our community, to, you know, have your feet in the earth again. I told you it was going to get a little bit hippie. But take your shoes off, um, spend a bit of time in the earth on the weekend. And it's amazing just how quickly that connection returns. Um, and in business, I think that's been lost over the last few generations or certainly the last few decades. That connection to community, that connection to locality and where you're from. So we've seen certainly during COVID at a time where we lost 160 stores in 48 hours and we thought we were done. Um, but then what emerged from the ashes of that was this connection that people had to each other and to community. And that's since played heavily into our, uh, to our advantage because we were only really focused on being local, distributing local and working with local produce and product. Um, and that's actually been probably our biggest advantage over our competitors during all of this and the conversations we have now with our stores and our partners are very different conversations that we would have had and they're more honest open conversations and i think that's probably the first step and i'd love to see where this sort of goes over the next few years and i hope what we learned through COVID and what we experienced the the positives of that i hope that tends i hope that continues to flow through business and you know, the time to come yeah great question does anyone else want to answer yeah, I just want to, so um, just from our experiences with trying to do, like I worked for a long time um, within schools and doing consultancy work and looking around innovation and scaling innovation in organizations. And oftentimes with employees, the, the conversation is around all oh, the policy um, constraints and the conditions that limit creativity and innovation in a system. And that is definitely a, a challenge. But um, for us, it, the biggest change has to be that cultural change and it's around shifting narratives. So a lot of the work, if you are looking to do creative work in your industry or, or create a new industry, um, it's, it's shifting mindsets and working with people to convince them that, no, actually, we can't. Why can't we do it this way? We can. Uh, and here's how we can start to push the boundaries. And that's kind of that bottom-up approach. And I would say that's like probably 80% of the work is just convincing in my industry of education, like convincing parents, young people, and teachers, like we know that we need to do it this way, and here are the steps that we can take to this, and we can do things differently. And then the policy comes in and the resource flows in that. And that's kind of, I, I would say that's important, but it's not as important as the initial cultural changes that we need. With the policy change for us, you know, and, and my co-founder worked for, has worked for many years in government policy. Um, and governments don't want to just be told, here's everything you're doing wrong, here's all the problems. They want costed and evidence-based solutions, and that's why it's so important for individuals and companies to take a bit of a leap and prove things alongside the system. Our challenge was, because we're, we're technically like a kind of a private school, I guess, in that we are um, not, we, we're not funded in a traditional way, where we have to be at the same cost or cheaper than public education if this is going to be a systemic solution. And so that's how we've operated our model. We're very low fee and because we can't access government funding. 
And um, but that way we can show that here's how you can do it and go back to government and say it's done, we have the evidence and it's the same cost that you're paying per student to educate them at the minute. And, and so I think that is um, has been a massive thing for us, cultural change and then bringing policymakers a solution that's not going to affect their bottom line because that is the that's where the mindset is at now in terms of economics, it's, it's money and resource flows. So if you can speak that language and kind of infiltrate that way, it's, it's been work for us. Yeah, yeah, that was really nice. Yeah. Um, I, I think, and, and this is certainly where I've been, and it sounds like Moran as well, uh, really focusing, is that I think there is, uh, we're trying to address uh, collective individual passivity that uh, is associated with the change, right? We talk about change, and it is something that's outside of our sphere of influence as far as most of us see it. Like we as an individual can't make the difference. It's the big companies I used to work with, the big company I know, you know, they ultimately they are there to meet these their shareholders and customers. Right? Um, policymakers the same thing as Rebecca just mentioned. You know, you can't just be on policymakers and tell them that we need to make a change without actually making a change. So really I think um, being able to make informed decisions, that's probably a huge gap that exists in many complex markets. So food is one of them. Um, waste is another. And being able to offer some sort of objective, comparative solution that you know potentially allows them to make a better decision. You know, every dollar they spend. You, know, you mean the consumers making the consumer? Yeah. So better and better decisions. And ultimately that will steer the product that a company produces or the policy it gets made. You know, a policy maker is not going to take the first step into obscurity. You know, they need to know that there is a, a potential successful solution. So I think um, we need to become as individuals far more active the way we approach life. So when you say we mean the consumer? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. individual consumers. All right, we might take another question from the floor. Anyone else want to ask a question to our panelists? It's all got a little bit serious. <laughs> it's good. So, um, changing like um, consumer behavior, um, culture, very typical, obviously. Um, do you guys have stories of like a particular win that kind of really helps you kind of push through some of the difficulties of trying to change? Culture, user, um, user behavior, consumerism, uh, and and particularly like an individual that perhaps is opening their eyes and going, there's a different way doing stuff. Is there a win? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think um, probably first comes to mind is Ross and Hippie have done some really interesting things around shifting towards a culture of reuse in beverage. Did you want to maybe um, start by answering that one, Rob? Yeah, so behavior is actually an interesting one because um, generally we can look at behavioral change. Um, traditionally, in the past, it's been from top down. Uh, it's a very difficult one in beverage because it's a very linear model in which we operate in. So, instead of our biggest vertical, and fortunately for us, the declining vertical is our distribution, which is the linear model. Um, we try to sort of convey our philosophies through you know, the, the, the IGAs that we deal with. But if you're just dealing really with management, then sub management, then sub sub management, in the day packers and handlers. Uh, and really any impact that you're trying to make through there, I guess through that medium, is just completely getting lost. So you can't make that behavioral change from the top down, we find through that vertical. So um, again, COVID was, was kind of fortunate for us in that it helped us expand and launch other verticals, and these are our, our circular verticals. Probably not vertical, but they're circular, I don't know what you call them, they're circulars. So um, uh, one of the first one we did was the um, the, the UP Homes, so it's our home. Uh, our home subscription service. Now we wanted to do a subscription service um, selfishly because we're a business um, facing extinction I think on March 23 at about 9am and we had this ready to go and we thought selfishly we needed to have a subscription model to keep us going but we also wanted to take away all the backstops that existed in that sort of model which is you know hooks into people um, you know very linear sort of wasteful sort of ways and we thought well let's actually do it in a way that's sort of in line with what we want to do and what we believe in and that is that we want to be able to deliver the contents 
of the bottles and the packaging, which is really all we are there to do. So we, we must believe that we're only there to brew butcher, we're not there for anything else. So we actually priced it and we, we built the bottle in a way that we could deliver the volume um, and basically credit the consumer for anything that they return to us. So, and it was, it, it's an extremely, um, uh, it's, it's, um, the, well, the nine, it's, I think it's nine dollars uh, we return so that we deliver as a credit. I'm not explaining this real. Um, so we deliver a box say for forty nine dollars, and we get the consumer a nine dollar credit if they return. Um, and the idea for that is is that we were trusting that the consumer is going to stay with us long enough so we can tell a story. And over that course of time, we under undershot with how long that journey would be. So we've still got some of our original customers from March on a fortnightly subscription, and we're seeing behavioural changes. So. We've actually been able to tick a box that we've made a to change on a consumer level, which is something that a lot of it's 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 a privilege because a lot of producers don't have that opportunity to be that personal with their consumers. Um, and I've got a story I told you the other day. We we're actually uh, higher than a hundred percent return rate because we've now changed some behaviours so much that when they run out of our product and they buy it at the local supermarket, they're running back to get those into our packaging to return to us. We're getting a better than one hundred percent return rate at the moment. Um, and so, you know, I guess from that perspective, we're getting really good back that feedback from our consumers for engaging them in our new product. And now we're sort of taking the next circular that we're launching, which is to work with particular type of suppliers and stockists and moving away from that being a supply model. And we are actually getting validation on stores that are wanting to support this model. So it's still very early stages, but this is probably the next thing for us to score. But empowering them to make behavioral change one on one with their consumers. Because I think consumers really, they just, it's, there's just too much noise out there. They're not getting the message. And unless you've got access to the expensive mediums to really brainwash them, um, it, it's really hard to get a message out there. It's, it is an organic sort of story that needs to be shared. Um, maybe uh, Daryl, or I think maybe Daryl, you could talk to like behavior in consumption of food in restaurants from your experience in your normal, and maybe talk to um, like, Changing perception, maybe in parenting, and, and what an education looks like for a young know, human. Darren, maybe you first. Uh, we we noticed a few changes uh, while we were talking specifically with regards. To, uh, certainly, when we first opened, uh, what we were asked by our customers was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we didn't have these menus. We changed quite frequently. Uh, we didn't offer stores because there's no real market alternative that we can just go and use something. Um, in the space of a year and a half, that would change. And I think it's through some very progressive policy making. Uh, you know, we've, we've actually uh, seen a lot of new products into the market that really address some of these gaps and shortfalls. Um, but we and we'd like to say that we led the change, but I don't think it was that. I think we just came at a very point in time in West Australia's history where we started to really reconsider our relationship with waste and um, really think about our uh, impacts. Uh, certainly, you know, obviously, you know, we were a business that really was resonating with the community. We probably still open, uh, but there were many other factors. That back, um, you know, many things that you can't, as a as a business owner, directly impact. You really rely on just the success of your community. Uh, you want to as well. Um, I think that's really all that I have to add on that one. Um, it, it has it has changed, and whether we uh, whether cause it actually, but one other was our staff. Um, our staff, very young, very committed a bunch of people that came to us and really went over and above to support the business. Uh, but they're all in different restaurants at that age and things like that now. And constantly reporting back on the things that they're changing and you know the conversations they're having with people. And that for me is a thing that really keeps me going. Um, it's really, really exciting. And um, I would say that's probably a really good thing. I'll, I'll just quickly come, I guess I come from another angle. If you are, because I worked in a um, for a philanthropic organization for a number of years. So if you're in an organization like a, a 
state government level or working for Black Free or a company that has quite a lot of money <laughs> to spend on systems change. There's a great group called the Foundation Strategy Group, FSG, who, who um, published some work on systems change initiatives. And I think I was going to tell the story and I was like, I forget all the details, but I'll give you the gist. And I think the paper is called The Water for Systems Change, which talks about the different um, kind of levels of change that you can work across. But one thing they looked at in particular was um, um, funding and narrative shifts. So I talked about that kind of cultural change. And they give an example of where foundation, this where I've completely forgotten all the details, but it's a foundation in the States and it was a particular county where, um, and again, I'm pretty sure it was uh, drug use, so the care of the drug, but they had just chronic um, drug use problems and they were asking that question, well, how, how do we have to change this? And they looked at the research around cultural change and mental health change, and they just said, well, why don't we just fund a series of ad campaigns, and there was probably a little bit more complexity to it than that. But by just putting, shifting a narrative around how to change this behavior and outcomes, and they saw it was crazy, a significant drop in drug use and, and health outcomes in any within a um, relatively short amount of time. So again, I'm sorry, I don't have the details, but um, it, it does show that the power of narrative shifts. And I think we see that now in, in, on social media with um, grassroots activism and how different narratives can take off and, and really change um, how customers or just um, citizens view a problem and what they expect and what they then demand of their policymakers. So again, depending on what your problem is, and um, it, it may be worth looking at how you can invest in actually changing a narrative among your customer base, or or even more more broadly, um, and whether you can collaborate with other groups that are interested in similar stuff to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got a question just there? Yeah. So maybe to continue on the same topic, but to Julia and Andran, uh, maybe with, with a bit of recycling. So. Um, dealing with plastics, I've always been around the ocean a lot of my life, and I was scuba diving and uh, had been diving a few places in plastic. Um, and having an experience like that, it really sort of hits home that it is such a big issue. Um, and so to maybe go on a recycling problem, where do you think it's most important at the moment to look for the education and sort of change the thinking? Is it at the individual level where we need to focus more on that education about you know, what we're buying, consuming to? tackle that problem first or does it have to come more top down just on people's yeah I, 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 I think it has to come from the bottom from the top and from everywhere but like on an individual level like where i like to operate and it might be from my experience like i'm from brazil i work lots in indonesia and one thing i see and even in australia i see on an individual level i think we are working the same like when it comes to circle economy i think we naturally wired to that like we actually want a connection we want a, a better life for our communities but i feel that that, that system around it is it's very hard to change at the pace that we want so i, I love to educate children and i get lots of uh, behavior change very quickly in the end but to actually change something five years time like i think we need to go a bit more like i like to operate on that systemic level so for instance in Indonesia, the reason why they're using so much plastic is because they cannot afford to buy a bottle of shampoo. So every day they go and they have to buy tiny things, right? So how can we show to, to the company or, or, or like that we can just put a machine there, they press a button and they get that little thing. So how instead of just changing the behavior because for some reason they cannot change, how then do we change the business? So they don't need to change so much the behavior and the change comes a bit quicker. So I, I love to operate on that level and, and I feel that even in Australia, like I can go to a massive business that operated completely linear, that they have slaves on their supply chain. I go there and I talk with one leader and I look at their eyes and I see on that individual level, that person wants change. But I think it's the fear, you know, they have kids that they need to feed at night and whatever that, yeah, for me, it's more about how do we make people realize that you as a person, what you do on your daily life makes a difference and you have a loss of power you know, and, 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 and bring that thing that we all have, like we naturally wired to do things right. And somehow our economy grew in a way that's completely artificial, like the way that we, we operate as humans. So how do we come back at realizing that we're part of a nature, we are in a limited planet and we all 
So yeah, like me, I, I, would, I like to like, I, I like to operate on an individual level, but I think there's lots of work on like how do we, bring, we need just a few individuals to stand up and then think how do we change the system on a level that things go in the speed that we need to survive like, as a species on this planet. And, yeah, and if anyone interested, I think we talked about this in our event last Thursday, that the new plastics economy work by the Alan MacArthur Foundation is, is very aligned. Um, but our state government also just released um, a plastics discussion paper, and, and that's open to feedback as well. So we're coordinating a submission and just, I think, helping government sort of understand circular economy um, and make better policy and legislation to create the enabling conditions for that so we can all play our part. Um, Loren, did you want to add anything? Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think it needs uh, two level approach. One is obviously uh, uh, currently what we need is a lot of education and a lot of awareness around the impact that it creates uh, about what we're doing. Uh, but more importantly, what needs to be sort of part of the long term sustainability is behavior change and at the level. Um, uh, like I was supposed to actually uh, share one of the stories, a um, previous uh, question about uh, the one you asked, um, uh, and also I think goes to a level that you asked in relation to behavior change and, and how we make changes. And uh, one of the conversations we had with uh, council in Victoria, uh, one of the household, households about you know how this, this is going to change their behavior and everything. Uh, the first thing was they didn't know that this was supposed to be from within, just a lack of awareness. But then what was interesting was the person said, his son or daughter knew what goes where. Mm -hmm. So at at at, uh, at a level where they probably, I think I said their daughter was like less than ten years old. So there's a lot of education that's going going around. And and my worry is that is that education being lost at a point where they've been switching back to the new normal, which is what we see now, which is just the linear economy. So I think we need to find a way of protecting that knowledge that is in our children. Even my daughter tells me about all the ways and. You know, she uh, she doesn't want to throw anything. She wants to create factor on that. So again, so we, we want to make sure how we protect that. So that's one of the key things. That if we can protect that generation of knowledge, and I know they all have the right intention, I think there will be a underlying change for in the next decade. But in terms of what's happening now, I think it's a lot to do with education, a lot to do with what goes where, uh, and also showing them the impact of what happens when they throw the wrong stuff in the wrong place, or if they buy something that is just you know, a, a good example is um, uh, even though we just buy a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee has got a long chain of impact that goes with it. So a simple thing as that has got, um, I don't know, a, a 10,000 kilometer journey before the coffee ends up in your cup. So so again, we need to understand, you know, do, we, do we need to rely on that model or do we need to go to a local model like what we're trying to do is, why can't we sustain on a local economy model like how, how things happen in South America and India we all happen to survive on the local economy model. Uh, the large consumer model only came about in the last 15, 20 years, which is what's creating a big problem for us because everything is very cheap. And, uh, and unfortunately, given the, you know, we, we, are, we are accustomed to convenience. So, so we need to move away from that. So I think it's, it's a lot of effort to be done at different levels. Uh, and I'm understanding David business is trying to do that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we'll get there. Uh, it's just a painful process now, but I think COVID has really made a big impact on that because everybody realized how much they buy. Everybody realized how much, uh, put it in blunt, but junk they're actually buying off the shelf and, and, and how much of traveling they're doing. And, you know, they're able to do a job without traveling. Why do you need to travel in a car, producing their mom? You know, there's a lot of thinking going around now. Uh, and, and I think a good example was, um, uh, there was a post uh, done by a newsletter on New Delhi where someone 300 kilometers away took a photo of the Himalayas saying they never saw that. So that's because of COVID, because there was no traffic, everybody was in lockdown. Mm -hmm. And people could really see the change if there was a change. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, even though COVID is a negative thing in the state in terms of human health, I think it's bringing out a lot of positive and rather than that. So I think, again, we want to look at all the positive sides of how we can come over that. Yeah. Um, we might just start to wrap things up now, so it's 8.55, uh, but it's been a really good conversation uh, this morning. I, I've definitely enjoyed just taking a bit of a back seat and listening in. Uh, last, maybe closing question for the panel, uh, or a two-sided question. So what's your favourite um, bit of circular tech? Um, so it could be in, in your business lives or in your own personal lives, because that's sort of maybe a bit of a theme that 
Um, we didn't go into too much um, this morning, but in sort of um, for West Tech Fest this week, I guess, and some of the um, a few more of the events that we're going to later this week. Um, and also, what's your, your favourite bagel flavour? <laughs> so, the bagel flavours we got this morning um, jalapeno cheddar, that's my favourite, uh, rye, everything, and I think we had blueberry as well. Um, so, yeah, Daryl, if you want to kick us off. Okay, who's ready to go? Well, I must say, I really enjoy the cheese and jalapeno bagels. Another half way from your there, and um, and then in terms of circular tech, I get you know at the end of the day, circular tech. When I googled, <laughs> I you know, there's actually not that much out there on it. But I, to me, it's that idea of circular economy embedded within the tech industry. I love what Total Green and um, recycling are doing in based in Perth in in collecting uh, electronic waste and repurposing it. And um, I guess to me. That's one that I can think of, one that we can benefit and um, benefit from an idea because there's so many companies that dump their technology after a couple of years. And a pre previous work I did was Coda Dojo WA, which is a technology and coding clubs for kids. And oftentimes we just create partnerships with businesses where their two year old laptops, which are still pretty spick if you're an eight year old into coding, and um, come to community and, and are used by the community. So anything that is kind of redirecting waste and, and to be reused by communities that probably can't afford to buy new and um, is cool in my looks. So yeah, total green recycling. That is a total green waste recycling. Uh, total green recycling, yeah. Total green recycling. No, um, cool. We're actually, I have a refurbished Surface Pro from Total Green as well. So we get a lot of our technology, but awesome supplier. Um, yeah, total green recycling, good plug. Rob? Uh, I'm still gravy on the bagel street, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I may have one, I don't know what it was, you bought it, so um, I think it's going to be the jalapeno one, I'm not sure. Circular tech, um, for someone that's trying to actually get rid of cars at home with a family or with a six year old, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's something we're, we're trying to do. So um, I am a little bit challenged about some of the right sharing platforms out there, especially given COVID and what we saw happen with the likes of Uber. So, uh, yeah, they haven't launched yet, but I already know that it's going to be my favourite piece of tech is, uh, is right there. Because it, it just empowers the, I guess, the drivers to be part of a, a new economy or a new system. Uh, and it empowers consumers to jump on board something, which makes sense to most people to share resources that are currently available. Yeah, great. So, anyone anyway, that's interested in that, um, that's built by Ninja Software, a company in Big Park. Another good plug. Thanks, Rob. Uh, who wants to go next? We'll just go down the line. That's easiest. Um, so my favorite bagel, bagel. Your bagel. Yeah, I'll bagel. It's a uh, it's a future one. So Milan is going to make a bagel with uh, our seaweed. So we're going to make the biopolymers. Oh, yeah. So we're going to also come up with a vegan one. I love the it. first seaweed farm that we're going to do at Milan. Someone shared with me just overnight a new milk, I think by Bruce, Marty Bruce, do a future milk that's made with seaweed, pea protein, and oats. I think so. Seaweed, it's a trending. It's a yeah, trending of too. course. Let's, let's start farming it. It's all happening. But the yeah, seaweed bagel, happening. there's a lot of potential there. I think so. We'll make that yes, and chat afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I think in circle business, again, it's something that I'm like looking forward for someone to give me the option to do that. Like, I love like the HelloFresh system because I'm so lazy and I hate going like shopping and thinking what I'm going to have for dinner. So I look forward to have someone that come up with a startup that let me do my grocery on reusable containers and bring it back and wash and use again. So um, I know that there's a few popping up but still didn't reach uh, my house so I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so my uh, favorite bagel at this time would be the rye. Um, in terms of the circular tech, uh, there's two business that actually comes to my mind that was quite inspiring me. They're quite early stages. Uh, they're growing up their ranks in Australia. One is called Future Green Solutions. Uh, they're based here in Perth, uh, a startup or BWA. Uh, and they're he heavily working around the organic waste circularity. And they're redefining the organic waste as a resource now. So basically, they're going to give a value. That waste, and the other one is in Victoria called Greystone. Um, so they are heavily working in the brewery industry and uh, they're redefining really again the same thing. 
uh, redefine waste as resource that they will put a value to it, and then at the end they all produce zero waste, and, and it all forms commodity. So again, that was a really interesting model that I really like. Yeah, dude. Daryl, what you lost? I didn't get. I didn't have a bag this morning, so I didn't pull the game. The and like Rob, I had not tried a bag until I left Australia. Uh, and I went to the US for a year overseas. They just changed my life. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm a big bag of pen. Um, in terms of circular tech, um, probably have to reiterate some of the perspective um, that a lot of the transport network providers. Um, you know, Uber, Polo, DB, Ride Fair, I'm looking for I'm really glad that that's. Um, but ultimately, anything that maximizes resource utility, um, like looking at the economics of cars is something that very few people actually do. It's just something that was, um, This is not even my favorite tech, so I'm going to get on that. that tech. My favorite tech is uh, something with a lot of potential. I think it um, it's, needs a lot of help to take off, but it's the only blue network. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's something that we're uh, familiar with a lot of people. Uh, it's going to be unutilized to build this Australia. It's a technology that's developed out of Victoria and essentially it helps connect individuals, food hubs, and primary producers uh, in the distribution of fresh food. Uh, so what they do is they provide an e-commerce pat platform uh, to support decentralized distribution. Uh, that is available was for free now for a very small cost to assist in that, uh, in that intent. Um, it's open source, not for profit, and that comes with the same challenges that uh, commons you can't commonly have that the commons without you know, the intent to maintain or uh, is the burden of maintaining such a disruption. So, um, if they can figure that out, I think that would be really, really interesting. But this is a, a movement that's growing to all points. We've got Canada, uh, South Africa, Norway, um, there's the Americas as well, um, the southern south continent, um, as well as Australia, New Zealand, the UK. Uh, and it's, it's really taking off. You saw through COVID. Um, Similar to, I think a lot of the responses we've heard is that um, it's really high in people's interest in global food, and as a result, they have their food. Um, so hopefully, they can switch back to this topic. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, please join me giving our panelists a big round of applause. We've got a bottle of Stella Bella for our panelists, just a little thanks. So, thank you, Nick, Red or White. Uh, there's another couple here as well. So, thanks, Manny, Rob, and, um, and also, just we're doing a bit of a stock take in the office the other day, but we've got um, just some new gears of crap um, boxes for people to ask questions this morning. So, I think you asked one. Uh, yeah, well, it was a good one on plastics here. We had Mike. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, cross that out and put a bagel on it. Um, we'll have a chat to Vivian's crowd in the next round. So, um, yeah, huge thanks for joining us this morning. Please hang around. Um, there, there will be no waste. Any bagels that don't get eaten today will end up in mine and Andy's freezer for the rest of the week. Um, just a quick plug. So, this is our last public event uh, for the year. Um, I think we're all going to enjoy some time off with our family and friends um, this Christmas um, and New Year's. But we're really excited to come back next year. Um, and I, we're really, both Andy and I are really passionate about supporting entrepreneurs, um, like five people you've heard from this morning, and also creating new conditions to have new businesses and drive systems change um, in the WA economy. So, that works. Yeah. So, there's something we're looking to launch um, next year called Thrive Academy, which is helping entrepreneurs and business leaders thrive by better design. So, if you're interested in that, um, reach out, have a chat to us, and follow us online, um, and we'll be releasing more information on that shortly. 
Um, enjoy the rest of West Tech Fest. Have a lovely day. Um, meet up and feel free to hang around and continue the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, cheers, mate. What's this? Uh, the cat <laughs> <laughs> <Not> all right. <laughs>